Welcome. Uh, I am Tuba and I will be the tech facilitator for this session. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions or difficulties. This is the learning sciences and learning theories in research on emerging technologies for teaching and learning session. It was designed for leaders with expertise on a topic to share information and examples with participants who want to learn more about the topic provide a forum for participants to discuss how they might incorporate the topic into their work and build connections between community members around the topic. And as you go through this session, I hope you get a chance to learn and think about what to take uh, to the strategy sessions tomorrow, where we start to make plans for how we can remake uh, broadening. And this session is uh, one hour. Uh, in the first half, there will be four presentations. And each presenter will get seven, uh, five to seven minutes. And in the second half of the session, we will start breakout rooms. So first, our first presenter, uh, I'm turning it to uh, over to Janet, uh, and I'm sharing my screen. Great. And you're gonna you're gonna move the slides? Yes. Yes. I'm yes. gonna tell you when. Yeah. Yeah. When when you want. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how to tell you, but go on. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I'm Janet Kolodner, and um, some of you know, I see lots of people I know here, and some of you um, um, don't know. You have to put it on, um, you have to put, yeah, right. Some of you know, and some of you, and then we'll go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Some of you know, and some of you don't know that I was the program officer at NSF that got the cyber learning, now RETTL. Um, program uh, going. And uh, I mean, there were a bunch of other people on a committee with me, but I was the, you know, I was the lead with Lee, I can't remember his last name. And um, next slide. And, um, and I um, was the one who was really focused on everything that we're going to fund is going to be informed by how people learn. So informed by research, informed by theory. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I'm doing the framing for the, um, for the session. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about the mission of the Cyber Learning and now the RETTL program, because I'm going to tie what I say about, um, what I say about using theory to that mission. OK, so the mission of the program is how the programs has been and continues to be to imagine and make possible the next generation of learning technologies, what they might be, how to use them successfully to foster and or assess learning, how they might be used together with each other effectively, um, how to integrate them into learning experiences, the socio-technical environment of a learning, ex learning experiences themselves. And um, the mission isn't just to invent things and just to imagine things, but to be informed by what is known about how people learn and what influences learning. And there's some people who get most of their money for, well, people work on design challenges and also on adding back into that research, that theory, um, but some projects do more of one and some more of the other. Next slide, please. Um, back one. This one. That's right. Next. Okay. So that gets us to what does it mean to be informed by what is known about learning? Okay. What does it mean to be informed by theory, by the research? There are, uh, you know, think about learning. People learn in all kinds of situations. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal. They fail to learn in all kinds of situations. They have difficulties learning in all kinds of situations. Their engagement and motivation waxes and wanes. Um, they People learn or don't learn some of what's intended of some things that were not intended. They pay attention, they don't pay attention. They bring assets, funds of knowledge to their learning. Um, they need a variety of different kinds of support as they're learning. And in any different population, there's a lot of, of learners, there's lots of variation in what learners bring and the support that they need. Now, I say that, point that out, okay? And we're talking about that in formal learning situations, informal learning situations. Those of you who have kids know that you 
interact with your kids differently and you help them learn different things. They have different interests. So to be informed by what is known about how people learn, to be informed by theory means to take into account what has been discovered through research, um, uh, also through practice about processes involved in learning, how, how you know, how cognitive processes, um, so sociocultural processes, learning phenomena, things like, um, well, I won't go into it, learning phenomena, interactions that foster learning, supports that learners need in different situations, what turns learners on, so they engage well, um, what turns them off, how to engage them, how to re-engage them, um, all of that with all the variation across different learners who you're designing for, who, you, who, who are gonna use the technology. Um, they're not all gonna get engaged the same way by the same things. They're gonna get turned on and off by different things. Um, we, uh, we also need to help them care. So they wanna learn and identify, yeah, how to support different learners or groups, what they require. Um, next page. So, Learning experiences that work for a whole variety of participating learners they are designed for include a variety of different activities. Some of those activities include technology. They may include a lot of different technologies. They can include a lot of different varieties of people with different roles. Um, and more, they have a lot of interacting component parts. Next. So we call those kinds of situations where we're mixing lots of technologies and mixing lots of uses of technology and um, uh, people who are participants who are, have different roles, we call those ambitious mashups, okay? We're gonna take a lot of stuff from a lot of different places, we're gonna put it together, okay? And we're gonna make it work. And if you're, if you are designing ambitious mash mashups, then you might imagine that you also have to be just as ambitious in mashing up learning theories and approaches, what's out there, mashing up lots of different things from the research on how people learn and on how to support their learning. Um, next. So, what are, is a learning, a theory? What is an approach, okay? So I know that this was called using theory, but I think that, you know, there are lots of different kinds of theory and theories. And when theories turn into ways of doing things, then it kind of looks more like an approach. So I don't want you to, to think that theories mean something pie in the sky, okay? Theories tell us something about how learning happens, the supports needed, what might work when, um, they can be big and small. So approaches, these things that are the how-tos of making, of, 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 of how-tos of, um, of supporting learning or designing learning environment, they model how theories can be implemented and they can be big and small as well. So theories and approaches can serve as umbrellas. They can also serve as, to get you to the details. So let me talk a little bit about big and small theories, okay? Constructivist theory, socio-cultural theory, theories with a capital T. Those are those big umbrella things. Um, they tell you something about what to, you, you need to take into account. They, they don't by themselves tell you exactly how to do it in your designs. But then we have some other theories that start getting closer to that. Little t theories. Maybe you'll argue that situated learning is, go back, that situated learning is a big t theory. I'm not, I, I, if I got my big and little t's, if we're in disagreement, it doesn't really matter. The only point here is that there are of all different sizes. Okay, embodied learning or cognition is a theory, knowledge building, a theory, culturally responsive or sustaining pedagogy, constructionism. We and then, to wrap up, sorry. We, we get to the, 
we get to the, you know, smaller ones. Constructionism is a theory and constructionism is a way of doing things. Learning by design is a way of doing things. Goal-based scenarios is a way of doing things. Knowledge building is a way of doing things. Um, retrieval effects, frequency effects, self-explanation, they're about the little stuff. Um, in modeling, is models and approaches as well. Cognitive apprenticeship, problem-based learning, they're umbrella theories, umbrella approaches. Learning by design, goal-based scenarios, project-based learning, they're, they're specifics of how to do cognitive apprenticeship, problem-based learning, you know, and make that all work. There hey, are, Janet, you're, Janet, you're already at nine minutes. Okay, so let me go on then, I'm sorry, next. Okay, so to be informed by a theory or approach means using what it proposes um, about how people learn or how to support learning to identify logic models or hypotheses that predict how learners are expected to achieve learning goals and to suggest ways of designing and implementing and doing it again and again. And I'm gonna be real fast on this next one. Please give it to me. The next one. Um, Go, skip this one and go to the next one. Okay, in the last research, um, one of the last research efforts I was making, okay, I was using a lot of different theories for a lot of different things. They each played different roles. Um, cognitive apprenticeship, problem-based learning, learning by design, et cetera, helped me imagine an opportunity to do something better, okay? Encoding specificity, case-based reasoning, intrinsic motivation, transfer literature, they helped me to act to, 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 to create the to create the solutions, the large and the small details. Okay. Identity literature, game design helped me interpret results. Okay. And if I move forward on that, I would bring in culturally responsive sustaining pedagogy and add that to the mix. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's it. I, I, I want you to notice that theories are of different sizes and that they're used for a lot of different things. Thank you, Janet, uh, for this presentation. You can go ahead, Neil. Excellent. So uh, I'm Neil, uh, and I actually run Assistments. Uh, and um, Assistments is a platform uh, that actually, this slide's good, uh, this uh, uh, platform. Um, that actually happens to have half a million children actually doing their classwork and daily um, um, and their nightly homework on almost all in mathematics. Uh, and, and this word e-trials refers to ed tech research uh, infrastructure for to advance learning sciences. Uh, and e-trials is my attempt to take my platform and let other people actually propose studies to run it on it. Um, and so if you are a learning scientist and you have an idea that actually works and can be made to work inside the 20,000 math teachers that are from, say, third grade to ninth grade um, and that are using the freely available um, Engage New York, Illustrious Mathematics, um, uh, uh, essentially textbooks, these free actually OER textbooks, uh, then you could propose to actually make small modifications um, and you can make these modifications in the way uh, the kids get feedback uh, and you can get really high quality, actually reliable ways of, of running a randomized control trial in this. Next, next slide. So um, I'll just say a little bit about what my goal is, uh, but tell you what, I'm going to get us back on track. Let's advance, advance actually down to the, um, um, go actually like four slides uh, all the way to where it says project history please uh and and this will be uh my final slide uh because it gives you a good sense in the far right hand side the half half but the half half to the right side here where it says dear, dear researcher welcome to here is an email that you could get that actually says if you were running an experiment um, it would actually tell you how many kids actually were randomly assigned into the different conditions that actually you created. Um, there's a little table at the bottom of this email uh, and uh, uh, where we tell you 
In this case, we're imagining that the researcher created a text condition, uh, one having to do with a um, two uh, in two video conditions, one where there is a human actually in it and another that is just a pen cast, uh, the thing called video pen. Uh, and it's telling you how many people started it, how many people finished it, uh, what percent uh, completed it. Uh, so if you were a researcher that actually, uh, and like that, that's a research question you cared about that you could actually do, then you could imagine running that inside my world. Um, and so there's lots of details uh, to that, but basically what's shown on the left-hand side is the actual software. You'd sign in and you'd build your study inside our world. Um, and um, anyways, NSF is funding me to actually help uh, external researchers. I'm super happy that uh, 10 other researchers have actually so far published studies using the eTrials infrastructure to run their studies. And 45 papers that I know, know have actually used our open data sets um, to do their own research. And I'm a huge open science fan. And so if you if that excites you, um, then you should um, you should come learn about actually this. I'll drop a little note in the chat. But um, um, with that, we'll get us back on track and our next presenter actually can go speak. Thank you, Neil. Jim. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Eli Tucker Raymond. I am a uh, research associate professor with the Earl Center for Learning and Innovation at Boston University. My work primarily seeks to create and understand humanizing learning spaces for learners who come from groups that have been systematically dehumanized in formal schooling, including African diaspora, Latinx, Southeast Asian, and indigenous learners and educators. In particular, I'm interested in spaces at the intersection of STEM, literacy, and the media arts. And so today I'm going to briefly share how I've come to choose theories of learning that inform my work. Next slide, please, Tula. So I want to talk about three questions that I think inform my choice, not only of learning theories, but then also the research methodologies that I, um, with my colleagues, because one of my commitments is to work with other people, um, use to understand learning. And these questions are, who am I? What kind of world do I want to see? And what kinds of commitments do I need to make in my design research to work toward that vision? Um, I didn't start with these three questions. A long time ago, I was a classroom teacher. And although I had ideas about what it meant to learn, um, like engage children in as many different ways as possible, let them author their own stories, give them an opportunity for choice, I really didn't have a, a theory of learning. But um, over the past, 25 years or so, those ideas have developed and changed. And I think that these can be broken down into three kinds of commitments. They are ethical axiological, or what I value, ontological, what do I think it means to be in the world, and epistemological, how do we as human beings come to know? Um, next slide, please. So in the ethical axiological domain, um, I seek to foreground care and dignity. I seek to create democratizing spaces that are both humanizing and liberatory. And again, I'm using the word I because I'm the one speaking, but this is really a, a we. Um, into the, in the onto-epistemological domain, I understand that learning is, is foremost, foremost a social relational process imbued with differentially distributed opportunities for access to power, but also that together we can generate power amongst ourselves, amongst people. And so within those contexts, I understand that learners are constantly making sense of the world, building on what they already know. And so this approach positions learners' understandings as integrated and emergent rather than as right and wrong or correct conceptions and misconceptions. And so each of these commitments means that I seek to create and be part of sets of relations that reflect them. I seek them in my personal and my professional life and in all aspects of my research projects in the and in the design of learning spaces that I engage in. So in who I work with, in what participants um, I seek to work with, in the, in the kinds of analysis that we do, in the, the ways that we collect data, in the ways that we disseminate. Uh, so yeah, next slide, please. So what does it look like? So if I value, and axiologically, if I value care, dignity, agency, empowerment, and collaboration, and I think the, the goal of learning should be self-determination. Um, and I think that meaning is made socially and by building on what we already know. And I think access to um, and within meaning making opportunities is inequitable. 
Then I use theories that pay attention to observable social interaction in, in mediated joint activity um, that include um, sets of power relations. So the learning theories I use are cultural historical activities theory, critical race theory, ecological systems theories, uh, identity theories, post-structuralism. How do we how do we disrupt um, you know staid status quo structures of power um, so that everybody has an opportunity to learn? Um, so the point is that my commitments to understanding learning theories, to designing for and understanding learning spaces come from my ever evolving personal commitments and beliefs. And it means that I focus how I understand learning to happen in the domain of the social rather than say the cognitive, because that's where I think inequitable opportunities to learn surface and where we can actually observe change by what people say and what they do. We can't observe what people think. So next slide, please. So um, finally, I just want to share a couple questions that I wrote as part of a blog, and I'll put the URL um, in the chat uh, that I ask myself as a white researcher who contributes to the designs of spaces that serve learners from community color. Um, they reflect my, my commitments that I talked about and inform my practice as a design-based researcher. Um, it's important that we try to part broaden participation in STEM with or without emerging technologies, that we ask ourselves those three questions I initially posed. Who am I and what is my story? What kind of world do I want to see? And what commitments do I need to make to bridge the two? Otherwise, I know we run the risk of creating sets of relations and learning settings that simply reproduce the narrow exclusionary and unreflective histories of STEM education. They're the same worlds, the same set of inequitable practices with new toys. Instead, we want to choose theories and methods that seek to be transformative, to be liberatory, to lead towards people's individual and collective self-determination a self-determination that to this point has been only been the practice of the few. Um, so I look forward to hearing your ideas in the um, breakout room and I'm put and shout out to uh, Monica Cardella who helped me with these questions. And I'm also going to share um, a link to an application for folks, early career researchers to um, learn how to write grants um, focus on racial equity. So if you know any early career researchers focus on racial equity, we're, we're uh, creating a workshop for them so they can apply for deadlines Friday. Thank you. Yeah. Berta, you're up next. Yeah. I'm giving Tuba just a second to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> to get the slides up, but I'll introduce myself while I wait. Thanks, um, Eli, Neil, and Janet. Um, really appreciate all three of those perspectives. And for those of you who are interested in that uh, grant grant proposal, uh, grant writing, um, grant proposal writing workshop, um, please, please follow up. Um, looks great, Eli, great work. Um, wanted to just quickly say that my approach to this question of how do we use learning theories um, to think about our work in this space and to uh, remake broadening in this space. I uh, did a little bit of a timeline to just help folks think about the fact that, you know, we add new perspectives to our work as we go along um, and they, they accumulate. And we, just like we do with students learning, we keep what's useful. Um, we background things that are not as useful, um, you know, but we don't necessarily, as Janet said, have, you know, have to think about these grantees or, you know, maintaining a particular perspective throughout our entire careers. I think one of the things that I would like to say is that, um, you know, my career, for some of you who know me, has been also a bit of a mashup of, you know, places. Um, it's not the traditional academic route. Um, and I think it has served me well in giving me freedom to make choices um, to move away um, from lines of work. Um, Tuba, can I help with the slides uh, sorry my computer Do I need to... got stuck yeah should i share yeah yeah. Be yeah 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 okay yeah, yeah. sorry that's, um, no, that's no problem my computer got stuck i figured oh. it happens yeah yeah all right all right, so um, can somebody give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides just to make sure it's working. Thanks, folks. Okay, so just really quickly, so we want to get to the breakouts. Um, my undergrad was in developmental psychology, um, which for me was about understanding how people become. So I was always identity uh, focused. Um, my first 
baby job pre PhD um, was at the Learning Research and Development Center at University of Pittsburgh, which was a total accident how I got that position. But it introduced me to the world of conceptual development and learning as like connected to identity. Um, and that was absolutely pivotal. Um, I had then another job at a data archive where I was trying to understand the kinds of research that was out there and what I wanted to study as a graduate student. And what I learned there was that methods are tools, theories are tools. Um, and depending on what our goals are and what it is we wanna focus on, we can, we, can draw from, um, we can draw from methods and theories as, as need be. All of this to say, you know, obviously we have commitments as individuals um, that drive our work, but that was sort of an eye-opener for me, um, that, you know, that I could play around um, and do, do what I wanted to do in terms of mashups. So I went to grad school. That um, quote in that call out is from uh, my advisor who convinced me to go to her lab by saying to me, classrooms were a space where, the, where cultural change was still possible. So I was like 100% hooked there because I come from um, you know, a multiracial background. I was committed to public education of students of color and um, in building equitable learning spaces. I went to UC Berkeley where I learned all the UC Berkeley things, learning as social, cultural, situated, um, started to think about you know, power um, and equity and diversity. So just very quickly giving you a space of where, where it kind of came from, because then I went to work at a research center where I got to look at so many different projects going on at the same time. Um, and what I came away with was um, basically what I ended up writing about in the design-based implementation research piece um, that was published many years ago. But what we care about is what works for whom under what conditions. Um, and that's just been the kind of tenet um, that I've worked with for a long time. And so I learned the approach of evidence-centered design, which helps you trace bias, um, which um, you know, helps you think about what it is you're designing and in what ways and helps that be extensible and observable to others, not just sort of a thing that you do behind closed doors. We integrated universal design for learning in our assessments and uh, assessments and instruction and in technology design there. So we learned how to design for um, multiple situations for learners of all kinds. We also learned there, I was part of the Life Center, we were thinking a lot about tracing learning across settings. And so we started thinking about um, cues for participation and engagement as necessary to understand in terms of supporting students opportunities to learn. So if you're not providing equitable opportunities for engagement and participation, and that we mean engagement in a multi-dimensional way, um, then, then we're not actually providing multiple opportunities to learn across the board um, in order to figure out and support what works for whom under what conditions. So there was equity in all, so much of that work. Um, but what also then came out were specific questions um, in, you know, that came out of those theories or in those perspectives that I was learning, including scaling issues and systemic issues. Why, why can't we see things working in various places that we thought had so much promise? Um, and so started you know, focusing on design-based implementation research, wanting to understand processes of localization of design, interactions between designs and the people who use them and in the conditions that they use them. Started focusing on partnership-based work in order to understand those questions and started realizing that our partners work within educational systems that need to be understood. Um, and this now for me includes um, uh, a policy level and decision making. So what started off as a classroom endeavor for me and an assessment endeavor for me has now become a system-wide consideration of what works for whom under what conditions that includes the layer of policy lest our work go um, unheeded and unused. Um, so here's the second ambitious mashup that I really just want to point out. My second job is the job I have now, which is running um, an independent research firm um, here in Northern California, where I get to work with colleagues the same way as you all do in your daily life um, from academia, from, um, from research institutes, um, also get to do a lot more nonprofit um, partnership because of the lack of financial obligations that I have to large institutions from the seat where I sit. Um, and I continue to think that, you know, thinking about, you know, Eli's question of what do I care about, what do I want to focus on, to me, some of the most interesting and important questions are always in interstitial um, spaces um, between traditional silos, um, where a lot of us feel like we kind of have to associate ourselves, um, and crossing levels of systems. Um, it's where we absolutely have to integrate theories and methods in order to solve um, wicked problems 
lots more to say here, but I'm trying to go quickly and happy to talk more about it. Um, I just want to say like a couple of examples of that work for me now are in trying to aggregate or accelerate knowledge um, that individual researchers are building up and individual research labs and centers are building up around the interactions between design and context and processes of localization. Um, this is where for me right now, the goldmine is of understanding how we support um, equitable teaching and learning. Um, and then also thinking about um, all that co-design and DBIR that I love so much. Um, I'm really trying to figure out how to do that as part of educational design uh, decision making and in the policy realm. And I feel like I need now a second PhD to work in this space around policy uh, and decision making because there's so much that other people know that I don't hear. So it continues. Uh, the timeline continues on. And that's where I am today. So glad to chat with each of you and to be in this space. Looking forward to our breakout conversations. Yeah, so sorry, my computer got stuck and I had to shut my computer down and re-log again. Oh, um, no. So sorry. But yeah, now, okay. yeah, we did it. Yeah, uh, I'm, but I'm glad that I'm back right now. So we can do the breakout rooms right now. In each, uh, in each room, uh, each co-leader will be um, discussing, uh, facilitating and leading the discussion. So uh, the assignment will be random and how many, so right now, uh, how many minutes, maybe 20 why minutes. Why don't you announce the, what we're gonna be talking about in the room? Um, in the breakout rooms, uh, yeah. like you can, con to make connections, um, audience can ask you questions and, um, and like I think we, we have a, a have we had I think we have an anchor in question we do which is to ask folks about um, you know how they are remaking broadening um, in their work um, and if they are using and how they are using any um, design or theoretical um, ambitious mashups um, to do their work um, and then to just sort of talk across um, to see what we can learn from each other. So then I'm opening all rooms right now. See you back in 20 minutes.